I had the lucky shot to, to move to the United States in 1992 to attend college. And that's where my journey is in. A little personal background about me, I have a bachelor's in science from MIS, I have an MBA in technology management. On my day job, I am proud to work for one of the best corporations in the country. I lead a team of cybersecurity specialists looking for fraud. Now, it is not a uh, UPS, it's the one with the arrow on it, so if you're shipping something today, please use us. It will help my stock auctions. In 2001, I became a U.S. citizen, and a, uh, so I had to take a, uh, my test, and I became W4 DTA to the bank of program. Uh, let's see, the XCC, I have uh, 328 countries, give or take. Anybody going to P5 or BS7 this week? Uh, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I take care of you. And I am a contactor, the Xer and also I'm a voluntary examiner. Some of the places I've been to. Uh, Speak into the mic. Oh, wait, wait, raise the mic. Hold on. Tough crowd. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, what happened? There we go. So, some of the places I've been active from. Uh, Can I just take it off the stand? Yeah. That'd be better. There you go. Her name was Lola. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Different show. Uh, there you go. Uh, some of the places I've been active from, my first uh, expedition at the age of 16 was at South America 48. That was a, one of the first IOTA programs uh, we put together. Same year, 1991, we adventured to South America 51. And that year, the next year, we went to Alves in 1992. I, my last trip to Venezuela was in 2005, and I went to uh, South America 15. I used to reside in South Florida, so I used to be active on the Florida Keys, Marco Island. And I've been active, of course, from Venezuela, KP2, St. Croix, AP9, Italy, Spain, Canada, and of course, in 1992, I had a chance to go to Alves. All right, top crowd over here. <laughs> where do I where come, where come from? We were discovered by Columbus on their third trip. We were actually the only place in the Americas that Columbus stepped foot on. Uh, in 1499, America Vespucci was in charge of mapping the continent. He found Venezuela and called it Terra Firme and also called it Little Venice. That's where the name comes from. Uh, we have roughly a population of about 30 million people, give or take. Uh, Caracas is the capital and one of the biggest cities. And it's roughly about 3 million people who live in the city. Uh, and we sit above the largest oil reservation reserves in the world, more than Saudi, more than anybody else. And 1914, black gold was discovered. Or 1976, it was nationalized. Contrary to popular belief, in 1976, the government said the oil belongs to Venezuela, so all the American companies would have to pay taxes back to Venezuela. And that's a picture of where I'm from. And that's where Venezuela is at. Some quick fun facts about my country. We are a Poda, Soda, Boda, Iota, and DXCC paradise. We just a short fly away to three points for secure worldwide out of Miami. We have the tallest waterfall in the world. We are known for our beautiful women. And we, back, we can back it up. We have uh, 23 beauty pageant crowns. We're the highest producers, explorers of MLB players, so you can thank, thank me for Mickey Cabrera. And we're the highest consumers of scotch in the world. <laughs> and we also have the best room around. This beautiful thing was actually our proud and joy. This is called Angels Falls. It was discovered in 1935 by an American flying his plane, looking for gold. Jimmy Angel. Uh, discover it. In 1936, he actually landed his plane on top of it. And it's one of our, our beautiful things we're proud of. Uh, one of my dearest friends and mentor always says to me, planning the expedition begins with a dream. In 1984, the only expedition that has ever been done 
on Angels Fall, it started our journey to expeditions. The group actually operated from the top of the of the of the Tepui and activated a 4x5 ARB Portable 6. Let's uh, talk about the IOTA program. We have about 300 islands, uh, 13 IOTA groups. The most common one to activate South America 12, which happens to be a state. And it actually is a duty free, and it's a uh, wonder for tourists, especially Russians, Europeans, and Americans. We have like, it's fully functional casinos. Los Monjes is the farthest west uh, island and all the way down to North America 20, which is Abyss Island, YV0. Here's a little map of our overall IOTAs. Los Monjes, here's Colombia, and I will talk a little bit about that in a second. And Patos Island, which where our first one went to, is right here. There's Trinidad and Tobago, and here, uh, and here is Abyss Island. All right, like I say, South America 12, the most easiest ones to get to. Full international airport, uh, non-stop flights out of Caracas. South America 15, it is a military base. It has been in dispute for many, many years with Colombia because they want to get access to the oil. This whole area here is full of oil. Uh, and uh, the first expedition in 1994 had to cease operations because the Colombian military tried to invade the island. So the Venezuelan Navy had to act on it. I was in a 2005, uh, 2003 operation. Uh, Los Rockies, South America 35, is a tourist mecca. Very easy flight out of Caracas, takes about 50, 20 minutes flight, and it's full of uh, Airbnbs and uh, resorts. La Blanquilla is a, uh, there's nobody there, but the Navy will take you there. It's more so the center of the country. South America 44 has a little uh, airstrip. This thing keeps clicking. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, very easy to get to with the Navy. Hello. All right, so my first expedition was to Patos Island. South America 48, that was in 1991. There's been two expeditions to this. The last one was in 2006. And I don't think there will never be another one. I'll explain that to you guys in a second. Patos sits between Trinidad and Venezuela. More likely, Colombo saw it because he landed right here. So more likely he actually had to see the island. Um, during World War II, the Americans were stationed there to safeguard the oil coming out of the Orinoco River. There actually were two structures in the island uh, left by the Americans uh, that we were using in 1991. Like I said, here's Patos, and here's Trinidad. That's Makuro, that's the town where Columbus set foot on. That's a group in 1991. Over here, somebody I'll be talking about soon. That's one of my dearest friends, YB5 LIX. But this was a group. And of course, every first expedition takes everything in the kitchen sink. We packed a whole plane. Uh, when we landed, that's what we saw. It's a big mountain pointing to the north. That's the only beach that you have access to. And there's the two houses that were there. That was our refuge, and we pretty much took over the whole place. So you imagine 14 guys with radios transmitting like, right, right there. The expedition in 2005 saw this. See all the mangroves took over. The team got off the boat, machete in hand, clear of the place. But they found out this plant, it's called Machinel, or the biological name, uh, Hypomancy machinilla. This is YB5 Echo Echo Delta. That's a very deadly plant. If you consume it or touch the liquids, you can even die. Well, the doctor became blind during the expedition. There's our group in 1991, the last group, and I don't think it, there will be another group going over there. Avisos Otavento was our second expedition. I was in, in this one. Uh, this, my father actually went on this one in 1994. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's 
right next door to the ABCs, Arua uh, Curacao Bonaire. That's my mentor, Elmer Wabi Fife at Coeco Delta. Very bad place to operate, as you can tell. Uh, for those you guys don't know, usually French and uh, British uh, girls will walk around topless in front of you, so very distracting doing the pileups. Uh, La Archila is a uh, military base. It's also considered to be the equivalent to uh, Camp Davis for, for here. If you guys know the name of Hugo Chavez, uh, when he was overthrown, he was taken here. He was jailed here for 24 hours. Uh, so this one is a little more hard. You need to have an invitation to go to this one. Uh, South America 58 is in a national park, very easy to get to. For a couple hundred bucks, uh, about $200, you can have somebody take you and take care of you. Los Estigos, Australis, and Los Solas, just north of uh, Margarita. South America 63 actually sits outside the Orinoco River, who happens to be the third largest river in the world. Oil comes out of here. And uh, so it actually, the island is actually on the, on the ocean, so it does count for Iota. South America 66 sits on a, uh, just in the Venezuelan entrance of the Venezuelan uh, lake. Uh, beautiful place, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Morocco is in, it's in the national park. Then we're going to South America 66. We have this beautiful thing that happens 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's a natural phenomenon. It's a continuous lining. It's, uh, the scientists figure out because of the oil and the minerals, there's a discharge almost every couple of minutes. So it gets a little bit noisy around that area. South America 91, and South, uh, it's also a resort area towards the east of the country. And this, our last one I, I will talk about real quick, is our equivalent to our BS-7. We only do this expedition every 10 years because how hard it is to do it. That right there, guys, it's not snow, that's guano. This is a rock in the Caribbean Sea. that it's full of birds and that's you know, the first expedition failed the second expedition we actually got the national guard to use the helicopter that's just sleeping quarters living quarters uh our second expeditions we were uh, figure out how to bring things up the rock and that's how you sleep and that's how you transmit so you get to know your fellow hams very very well <laughs> and this was the last expedition thanks to ray novak for the shirts and they, uh, like I said, we do this every 10 years because of the difficulty of it. So let's talk about what everybody always bugs me about every single time I get on, on the air. Why be zero? Obvious, well, you know, it sits smack north of the Caribbean, very near to the Windward Islands, where the Rico's right here. A little history, on 1835, it was discovered by Her, uh, Her Majesty's ship. And it's actually the first records of people landing on the island. On 1854, the Brigadier Yardell uh, claimed the place for, for Guano. On 1865, Venezuela claimed the island, and the rest is history. It sits right now in lucky number 13. I expect next year will be in the top 10, especially if Bovet comes in the air and Crozet comes in the air. Here's the tricky part. They, even though it's a scientific base, it is controlled by the Navy. So here's the top of the, of the food chain. Conatel is the equivalent to the FCC. And here's the two clubs. The oldest one is the Venezuelan Radio Club, they turned 88 this year. And the Venezuelan uh, Sociedad of Venezuela. They used to be members of the same club. In the 70s, a group of guys got upset, went down the street to a bar. After a couple of shots of whiskey, they started this club. And to this day, they're still fighting with each other. Uh, this document is very important. A few years ago, it was, it, it was a signed treaty between the two organizations. And when you get lawyers involved, hand your lawyers involved, you get very creative. The way it works is every club has a shot and alternate. Right now, the Venezuelan Radio Club, it's their turn to go to. Now, there is a small clause, like always, where we have lawyers involved. If they don't do it within the time periods of six years, the other club has a chance to do it. 
the Venezuelan Radio Club right now is overdue on that. So stay tuned for more. Permits. So a little bit complicated. First thing you have to be, you have to hold a Class B hand radio license, which is equivalent to an extra class license. You have to have an organization that complies with the, uh, with the hand radio service regulations. Uh, you have to have a formal uh, application and authorization request to the Navy. Once they approve that, you can go to Conatel and ask for a call sign. Uh, on the permit, you gotta specify the day you wanna go, the day you wanna end. That does not mean that you're gonna, you're gonna get those dates. Whatever the Navy says is what you go with. Uh, this, this is new, this has not happened to me in 92, but it's, just, it's, a, it's a new thing. You will have to go to a very rigid background check. Uh, so military uh, intelligence will do a background check on everybody who's gonna get aboard the ship. And you have to make sure you pay all the fees and the taxes. If you're foreign, you have to have a reciprocal license agreement and you have to have a formal invitation for the radio club. So again, Here's Alves, here's Venezuela, 550, meter, uh, 550 kilometers away from mainland. That makes it a new, that makes it a DXCC entity. Why is called Alves? Very simple. Birds, and there are plenty of them. Uh, before, the, before, the, uh, before the base was there, it was very hard to find it, but thanks to the birds, you were able to see, uh, eventually see it. It's about 375 meters long by uh, 50 meters wide. That's right there. It disappears sometimes. It's about 13 feet, the highest point right over here. And six are around 340 miles from Venezuela, 150 miles southwest of Montserrat. And it's completely flat. Time to travel to YB0, December through May. You ask why? This right here. June through November is hurricane season. And that's what happens to Alves during hurricane. So I don't think you really want to operate during that time. There has been all these are the known operations from YB0. The first one was in 1956. In 1958, Danny Wells took the Yasme 2 to Alves. I will talk about that in a second. The last one was a different group, 4 and 5 DX in 2007. 2006 was my group, YX0A, YX0LIX, and I'll explain why there's two calls. In uh, 2004, uh, I saw Bob around here. Where, where are you? Uh, that was the group that went with Marty Lane in 2004 from the Venezuelan Radio Club. 1956 was the first expedition uh, to the island. Here's the uh, Danny Wells operation, 1958. It is a true story. There was a fight on the island. The Navy almost had to come get the Venezuelan operators. And it's recorded on the Yasmi book. On 1978, the base was built. That was how it was when I went. And 2004 was rebuilt. And that's how it looks today. Our club has been there three times. Uh, Form 0 RV, 92, that was in 87. Uh, I wasn't there in 92. And the last one with uh, YX-08. Here uh, was the second set of Americans who ever transmitted from Avis. That's Carl and Marta. Uh, Marta's call is uh, Dorian for FEU, which now is gay, and, and Carl Henson, Dolby before CNH. Uh, Carl Henson, who's uh, I think it's Q Hall of Fame. Uh, the first American to operate from Avis was uh, Julius Wengler with 6 y zero. He was on the Jasmine. And the first and only YV to over, uh, YL to operate from Abyss was Martha Henson, Dolian for FBU on 40 uh, in 1987. My journey to YB0 in 1992, we took this, this ship that was a ride. This is the plan that every expedition we use to go to Abyss. So SSB will be on the base, CW tent will be put over here. When you land, you get welcomed by two people. The, the, the captain in charge of the base and the, uh, the highest scientist in, of Fundena. He's the one who rules the, who rules the place. He tells you what to touch, what not to touch. Do not co come in contact with the birds. 
uh, Turtle Nest, it's very strict what you can do on the island. So you better follow what he says. First thing you do is put up the tent for CW at the highest point. That's Mike Benafo, K3UC, who used to live in Venezuela. He used to be uh, the headmaster of one of the American schools down there. He's also SK uh, a couple years ago, a Howard graduate. And that was my uh, mentor in CW, uh, one of the best CW operators I've ever worked with, yb 5 ANT, who also SK. Mike had a very heavy way to hit the keys, and we figured out a way to fix that. Uh, literally, he will pound them and think we'll be flying around. Uh, this was our SS, SSB team, YB5 Radio Whiskey, YB5 Lima My Whiskey, YB5 ADP. That's a pair of Drake T4X radios. They only put out about 35 watts. So if you worked us, that's what we were using. Of course, we went on the peak of the, of the solar cycle. do 2 gg trying to get six meters going. I'll talk about that in a second. When we first landed, we lost four radios. And it's our team trying to fix them while we were there. That's why we fight uh, Alpha Mike, who just recently became SK, and what we 2 IF, trying to get the 160 station on the air. Six meters, this was the first time we ever got average in six. We took this little radio that only put out about 15 watts. We have a very small three element. DL2GG said he was expert in six meters. He knew all the propagations in the world. He was the master. He spent about a day calling CQ, nothing. He gets upset, throws the radio out, says, I'm done. This was a waste of time. There comes the youngest hammer who ever operated from Avis. I sit down and guess what happens? The pilot started. I spent oh I spent two days sitting on there working North America and South America nonstop. To this day he wouldn't let that go. So it tells me it was a, a lucky shot for me, but yes. We got six meters on the air. Here are the, oh, come on. Here are the two youngest members, Bobby Fire Radio Whiskey. He was 19 and a 17 year old me. I wish I was a skinny again. And there's our group. That's YB5 India Victor, which I will talk about him in a second. And I'm so well, that's me right here. And we had a pro oh come on. We had a problem. We only brought logs, this is before computers. We ran out of paper, true story. The, Na the Navy gave us some more paper, we ran out of those papers too. Well, solution to the problem. To this day, uh, 38,000 QSLs on three days on the island, still the highest record of QSLs from Abbas. Don't worry, we backed it up. <laughs> All right, 2006, we go back to Abbas, and you wonder why there is two calls. Well, let me tell you a little story of what can happen when you hit the expedition. I, well, I'm about to, <laughs> all right. Come on. That's the old base. We got invited to go operate on the new base. Stay of the art air conditioning. There was no AC when I went. Uh, wi Fi, everything else. The helipad was here, and now the helipad is over here on the new operation. The team actually had to use helicopters this time. It usually, uh, when I went, it took us about five hours to disembark the ship. Uh, so th this was quicker. Uh, there was some transportation. Uh, Uh, the ship, oh, okay. Why don't you just try manually? Yes, try that. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so there's the photo to, this photo right here is very important for you guys to know. That's Jose YB5 LIX. Those two members are from Conatel. We can very key on this trip.
Okay. So why two calls? Okay. That's what that's where the presentation is at. Okay. Stay there. Why two calls? Very simple. Uh, the night around 10:30 p.m. the first night, a uh, couple guys found Jose in Hunchins on the island. The two doctors on board the team, YB5 Equa Eco Delta, YB5 Indian Victor, tried to revive him, and he suffered a massive heart attack on that on Alves. And the operation stopped. The Navy sent back the helicopter. Ramon went back with the body uh, and the ship. The team completely shut down the operation, uh, not knowing what to do next. And one of the team members said, how about if we change the call sign to Honor Jose? I got a phone call around 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, my time in Miami, telling me, we're changing the call, this happened. I started getting a phone and emails out to the ex that says, this happened, I will know more later. And the operation started again. The for, folks from Conatel on the spot says, go ahead and change the call. So that's how it became YX0 uh, LIX. Yeah. If this will collaborate, we'll be over soon. Here's the team, minus two operators. And then the question I get asked every time, when YB0 will be back, stay tuned. Thank you all. I'm around if you have anybody, any questions, so. When will we be back? Buy me a beer and I'll tell you. <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, there is a political situation going on in Venezuela. Convincing the Navy to take you and pick you up within that window is hard. Uh, there's been attempts to have a private vessel. No, we cannot take a United States uh, registered vessel there for obvious reasons. Uh, the RCV should be working on it. Uh, I, to me, if you have was a betting man, the next expedition will be a combined expedition with the two, the two, two clubs. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of years. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. That was the first one I mentioned, South America 12, Nueva Sparta State. Margarita is, the, is the, uh, one of the cities within there that's full of casinos and, and resorts. Very easy to get to from every, pretty much anywhere. Has their own international airport as well. Anybody else? Any other questions? No, I do not know all, any other Miss Venezuela's phone number. So, anybody else? All right, guys. Appreciate you. If I have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you. Uh, we, no, you gotta, we didn't take it out of there yet. Okay, thank you, Steve, very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're all waiting for Aves to come back on the air again. All right, again, reminder, at the end of the uh, forum, there will be a drawing for an IC705. They're selling tickets back in that far corner over there. Well, actually, we have a couple people walking around with their hands in the air. Uh, five bucks each, or five for 20 bucks. A great deal. All right, our next speaker, uh, I hope you know him because he's been on I don't know how many the expeditions. But yeah, this is Greg W6IZT, and he's going to be talking to us about the rig and a box. And I don't know if you've been exposed to it or not, but this is a very interesting concept. First, I was exposed to it was last year at the uh, Cincinnati Ham Fest. Actually, it was called the Milford Ham Fest at the time. And uh, he had actually the box there for us to look at. So, Greg, I'm not going to waste a lot of time. As soon as you're ready, raise your hand. I am trying. All righty. And uh, we'll go from there. Until he's ready, any other questions out there? Maybe Steve can stand up and answer them or whatever. No other questions? All right. All right.
what happens when you're not up first. Is there a 12 year old kid in the house? <laughs> I see some familiar faces out there. Good to see you all. All right, you ready for the rib? Let's see if we're working. Uh, we're going to try another pointer. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Uh, let's try this one again. Is that? This one's working. All right. It, it's all yours, Greg. Thank you very much. Let me take this. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to, uh, to join us. It's a, a pleasure to speak here. I've done a few of these in the past, and this is the first one in Xenia. It's a much nicer room. Let you all know it's really hot outside, that this is the place you really want to be. So I'm here to talk about a project um, that I got involved in a couple years ago. Uh, it's called Rig in a Box. So what is a rig in a box? It's a complete, fully self-contained, remotely operated kilowatt station. And it makes the expeditions more eco-friendly. It eliminates the need to camp on the island, simplifying logistics, and uh, just uh, taking a wholly different approach to how we go about and activating rare entities. A little bit of the background, uh, the RIB deployment is being sponsored by the Northern California DX Foundation. Uh, they sponsored the construction of six RIBs, which was born out of two prototype RIBs which were developed uh, before this project got underway. Um, George AA7JV designed and built two what we'll call first generation RIBs, at which time NorCal got involved and we started this project to build six ribs. Uh, testing started and continues to be underway uh, in the Bahamas. Um, and testing continues to prove out the solution, its reliability, scalability, and performance. If any of you have worked C6 AGU in any of the DX contests in the past couple of years, uh, you've worked a rig in a box. And the focus of the solution is expanded beyond just the box itself, but looking more at a total um, deployment scenario where we can get the equipment on the island quickly, we can get our antennas set up very quickly, and be on the air uh, in much less time than a conventional, what I'll call tent city type gener uh, expedition. And I'll go into that a little bit uh, further on in the presentation. So really, it's not too different, different than your home station. We have a radio, obviously. We have a one and a half kilowatt LDMOS amplifier. We have antennas. It's common in today's station that you have a network. We have a power source. And the only difference is the radio, the amplifier, and the control systems are housed in a modular, weatherproof, environmentally controlled enclosure. So here's a picture of George A7JV uh, and Mike KN4EEI with one of the uh, Northern California DX Foundation ribs. Uh, you can see it, uh, it's a very compact installation uh, and it's uh, very easy to set up and easily uh, rapidly deployed. So if you looked at a block diagram of a simple setup, uh, we employ Honda generators because they're very efficient uh, and very durable and we uh, add a five gallon auxiliary fuel supply to that so we can run the generator to get about 24 hours of runtime out of each generator. You've got the rib. Uh, there's a 900 megahertz link back to the boat. There's a backup battery um, and uh, your transmit antennas and your receive antennas. Very, very simple approach. So looking at a block diagram of the rib, and I like to look at it up here more than on here, um, you obviously have your power source, your 12 volt supply, a 50 volt supply for the amplifier, radio and amplifier, um, a data acquisition and control unit, which is sort of the brains of the solution and gives the remote operator access, visibility, and control into the rib. Um, where things kind of differ is we have two water cooling systems. One closed loop system uh, cools the internal of the enclosure 
and the other one cools the amplifier. The amplifier is water cooled, not air cooled. Of note here is this little box called an ultra cap. It's just between the 50 volt power supply and the amplifier. The purpose is cap capacitor bank and it's not measured in microfarads, it is in farads, I believe it's around 40 farads, is to smooth the current consumption on the amplifier during key down. And what this does is significantly reduce the stress on the generator. The generator doesn't have to respond as quickly to instantaneous load changes. It's easier on the generator and it also reduces fuel consumption. So here's the rib looking with the enclosure open. Starting on the right, we have a 12 volt power supply and a 50 volt power supply. You can see the capacitor bank. It's a blue uh, cylindrical uh, object uh, just to the right hand side of the enclosure. Um, the next is the amplifier and it's built on an open frame. It's not fully enclosed in itself. And underneath this box, it has the Northern California DX Foundation logo, is a Flex 6700. You can see uh, next to the amplifier, there's a heat exchanger to remove that removes heat from the enclosure, an ethernet switch. So really, it's a lot like your home station, just repackaged for this special purpose of operating uh, de-expeditions uh, and with a minimal footprint. And I had forgotten that I had all these pop-ups here or I would have scrolled through them as I was talking. So I got involved and I think the first trip I made down to the Bahamas was in uh, October, November, November 2020. And when we went down, we set up for CQ Worldwide. And we had five antennas. And these antennas were mounted on spider beam poles. They were vertical dipole arrays. I think the concept of the design originated uh, back in the early 1990s with the Clipperton Group. For CQWPX, we had reduced the footprint to two antennas. And we came back for CQ Worldwide CW and ran on two antennas as well. So as part of the rapid deployment scenario, we're continuing to look at a number of different antenna possibilities. Um, you can utilize an antenna that you might think is not optimal for use at home, but I'm gonna use the word compromise. A smaller footprint antenna when operated near salt water is very efficient and we're talking about tenths of a dB difference between a smaller antenna as opposed to a full size antenna. And the goals of the antenna effort are to find an optimal balance between performance, ease of deployment, size, and reliability. We could get a station on the air probably within 60 minutes of, t of the time that we left the boat and hit the island. So here's uh, George and Mike uh, with uh, Electra in the background holding one of the ribs and a couple of cases it's you know tools cables that sort of thing so this is one complete station so in contrast um, looking at the perspective of uh, doing a, a tent generator a tent city representation this is some of the material some of the material that went to Beauvais with us uh, a few years back quite a bit of gear. So this is the same gear packed in the container. So this is a complete station. Generator, antenna, rib, tools, cables, etc. And in comparison, this weighs about, it's for six stations, we're looking at about 1,500 pounds or a weight reduction of 94% compared to uh, previous techniques significant improvement. So here's a picture of one of the ribs uh, with emphasis on the water cooling systems. Uh, you've got one radiator system that cools the amp and the other one that cools the internals. So when we deploy these we typically set them up on a table and we close them and we like to use the shade of the trees it helps keep them cool but it, it's very straightforward and they get turned up very quickly. This is the power source for two ribs. We've got the five gallon auxiliary tanks and they siphon down into the Honda generators. One of the things that's of note is 
The Honda generators have a function called eco mode, which lets you reduce the idle speed of the generator, which reduces fuel consumption. We have the ability to put these generators into eco mode remotely. So no one has to go to the island to put the generator in eco mode. We're on the boat, we flip a switch on the rig, rib control panel, and we put the generators essentially into standby. And typically we'll have one guy, maybe two guys that go to the island once a day, top off the generators and come back to the boat. So you obviously need a control system uh, to make all of this work. And this is a, a, a graphic of the control system that each, each operator has on his PC. It's a little ribbon at the top and it shows you forward and reflected power, PA temp, uh, the push to talk buttons and the buttons that are green to uh, the right hand side, those are actually alarm indicators that if any parameter that's being monitored is exceeded, they go into alarm. For instance, high SWR, the amp goes offline and the operate button goes to standby and the standby button turns red. You also have uh, receive direction and control. So there's really four basic functions. The first is remote control. The second is probably the most important is to give the operator a level of confidence while he's operating to know that the solution is functioning properly. And the last thing you want to do is have a distracted operator. He's trying to run a pileup and he's having to, to constantly monitor things because he's not sure what's right. It's all here in a simple ribbon. It's right in front of you. Your logging program is open underneath it and it actually works very, very well. So this panel expands and you, can have, you have a whole other level of monitoring capabilities from input voltage, the PA voltage, internal temperature, uh, antenna tuner control, and a number of other things. So the, the monitoring solution also has the capability of sending alarm information up to a server in the cloud. And we were down in the Bahamas last year. The developer of this solution was texting me, telling me something was wrong before we knew it. So a little bit about the communications between the, uh, the island and the boat. There's two radios that we uh, are currently using. They both operate fairly similarly. They both provide the same amount of bandwidth. And the uh, 900 megahertz radios, on the boat we have omni antennas because the boat will turn around its anchor. And on the island we have a pair of uh, uh, dual pole Yagi antennas which you only operate in vertical polarization and we found that this is the optimal setup. Um, typically we're a quarter mile, half mile off the island but we've tested this out to much farther distances and it is very robust. So moving away from the technology itself a little bit and talking about what the rib can enable in terms of how it impacts the other aspects of the ex expedition. So being that it's modularly packaged, we have much fewer, much less equipment to move from the boat to the island when we get there. The radios, the amplifiers, all that moves in one container. The, the vision is that there'll be a complementary antenna for each rib and it'll be in a similar a container. So you take the rib on the island, it has a corresponding enclosure for its antenna, coax and everything, and it's all right there. There's no unpacking stuff, looking for coax, looking for barrel connectors, tape, whatever. It's, it's all very modular in approach. Um, simplified logistics. Most large scale expeditions, or a lot of large scale expeditions, the equipment would get delivered by boat. And that is a two, three, four month proposition with multiple stops from its point of origin to the destination. This solution can be shipped by air. Put the ribs on a pallet, strap them down, shrink wrap them, put them on a plane, and it's there in days. Reduce staging time. Uh, those of you who have been on big expeditions, you, you know that the equipment gets shipped to a common location, it gets sorted, it gets staged, it gets organized, and then Sometimes it gets put away and then comes back out to get put in the container. You get to where the team is meeting up with the equipment and it gets gone through and reorganized again. And in the case of the rib, we would simply take the pallets, take the equipment off the pallets, take the enclosures, 
put them on the boat and go. We know where everything is. It's much simpler. We're moving a lot, lot less equipment. So minimize setup and teardown time, and we're going to go into that in some detail. Less operator fatigue and significantly lower cost. So I put together a, a comparison and I ran it by some of the team members. And what we did is we looked at comparing a six-man team using ribs with a duration of 28 days on an island. Compared that to a more of a large-scale expedition approach, which would be a larger team for two weeks on the island. And what this works out to be, and it helps normalize the comparison, is the same number of man days or operator days. We look at going to a similar destination. Transport on the final leg is by boat, which is often the case when you go to these rare islands. The six-man team has four stations. The eight-man team has eight stations. Again, keeping things uh, aligned. With the understanding that in some situations, and a Beauvais is a good example, where a larger team for a shorter duration would be more optimal. So it's not one size fits all. You have to employ the right approach. So let's look at, this is a Braveheart model. And these are actual uh, budgetary figures that W8HC and I uh, were working through when we were looking at going to Chesterfield about the time that the pandemic hit. So if you look at the large team approach with the Braveheart model, and it rolls up to be about $450,000, and that would seem high to you, but 350000 of that is the boat. Another element of the cost is the upfront costs. And we've all, as DXers, have made donations to de-expeditions early on because their upfront costs are so high. Typically, half of the boat needs to be paid for before the team departs. And in this case, we're looking at 350 and 175,000 versus 90,000 and 45. Equipment shipment, large team, $20,000. Since we're shipping much less gear, we think that our number is closer to $6,000. So in comparison, 450,000 to 136,000. And we think these numbers are close. So let's take this analysis a step further and compare a large team, but using a similar boat to what the small team would use. The large team's gonna need more capacity on the boat, so if we made the boats the same, they would need two boats. So the numbers roll up, we're looking at 120,000 for a large team, 90,000 for a smaller team. And again, we're looking at you know, the costs on the large team model dropped to 226,000 and the modular approach stayed at 136.2. So you take the numbers one step further and it re the, the benefit, the economic benefit really starts to shine. So we talked about the 12 man team for 14 days, number of stations, and that works out to be 168 man days on the island. And the modular approach, half the team size, twice the duration, works out to be the same number of days. A typical tent based large scale expedition, you're looking at about three days to get everything set up, or 36 man days. We can do the same since our footprint is much smaller, we don't have tents. We don't have infrastructure, we don't have latrines. All of these things have been eliminated and are not part of the equation. And, cons and conversely, on the teardown, we're equally efficient. It takes more time to set up than it does to tear down. So if you break this down, you end up with a large team model where you have 108 man days of operating time compared to the rib modular approach where we have 150 day, three days of operating time. If you look at 1,000 cues per, uh, per man per day, it works out to be 108,000 cues 
compared to 153,000 cues. And I questioned myself on the 153,000 cue number, because that's a lot of cues for a de-expedition. But the game changer is FT8. FT8 is bringing a significantly greater number of hams into the fold to work the expedition. Uh, you know, if you get on FT8, you know, I didn't realize there were so many hams in Indonesia. I can get on FT8 in 40 meters in the morning and work 30 in the morning easy where I couldn't work 30 in a year before. So to net all this out, you're looking at approximately $2.10 per QSO cost for the large scale team model as opposed to 89 cents per QSO for the modular approach. Pretty significant improvement. So the value proposition of the rib. Minimal environmental impact. No tents, no latrines, no cooking, no stove. Um, it's a much simpler approach. Nobody, how, and then the, the next bullet is, you know, we can get the radios on the island, now we're focused on how quickly we can get the antennas up. So it's all about getting on the air as quickly as possible. There's nobody camping on the island. Again, we send one or two guys over once a day to top off the generators. There's no time, waste of time setting up tents, operator support and infrastructure. We're not moving operators back and forth from the island. Um, and this is, a re this is a real challenge. In some of these places where you have a, a, a high tide, high surf, you know, getting us young guys off the boat <laughs> in those conditions can be hazardous. Operator endurance is ha enhanced. Um, I can't tell you how exhausting it is to be operating inside of a, a tent where the, in the in internal temperature of the tent is above 120 degrees. You're, work you're, you're operating for nine hours a day. Uh, the fatigue adds up. Lower fuel consumption. And we already talked about the options of, of smaller teams and larger teams. And lower cost, minimal environmental impact, improved safety, more efficiency, and a better experience for those of you who are trying to work the expedition. And at the end of the day, it's all about making more cues. So, in summary, and I think I'm probably catching up on time, so, uh, evaluation and testing of the technology continues. It's been incredibly successful. It's not without its challenges. We've had to fix things on the fly. But all in all, it's working very, very well. And a lot of work went in early on to determine what the best technology, methodology, frequency range was to use to provide connectivity from the boat and the island. And we've landed on 900 megahertz. The equipment's very robust. You know, with, with TCP IP, you've got error correction. These radios have over the air error correction protocols. And it just works really well. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to the Southwestern Ohio DX Association. And I got a, where's Bernie? I got a scoop for you, Bernie. 2023 is the 100th anniversary of amateur radio involvement in expeditions. So the first was McMillan. McMillan went to the Arctic in 1923 with W1TS. They did some radio tests. So we're now in our 100th year of this aspect of our hobby. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Okay, for rain. And for rain, yeah. Okay, and also, in your closed loop, uh, is the cooling system closed loop? Does the water uh, go through a radiator and fans? Yeah, there's, there's, there's what you would think of, there's two radiators. One functions as a heat exchanger internally. There's a pump and a reservoir. The, the coolant is pumped to a, another heat exchanger, which is the radiator externally, to take the heat out of the amplifier and the enclosure. Yes, sir. I didn't assume any mode. I questioned the number as a whole, and then I said, well, how do we get to that number? And it's going to be FT8. No, 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 no. CW, phone, and FT8. Typically, a two-week expedition would make on the order of about 100,000 cues. So when I looked at this, these numbers, and I said, how do I get to 150,000? And the difference, 
that's added on to phone and CW is going to be FT8. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and another incremental thing on that, not only to be FT8, is less setup time and uh, less uh, tear down time, so you've got more time actually on the air. I'm sorry, it's not my uh, speech, but we've got another one in the back. Uh, we got, just a second, uh, there's somebody here in the very back. How do you define a band day? Repeat the question. Uh, a, a man day? Effect of a weather on the boat. Uh, obviously, if you, oh, you mean just tidal action? There, we don't see any effect. The beam width of the antennas is wide enough that as the boat rotates around the anchor, it's still within the beam width of the antenna of the Yaggies on the island. Typically, yes. One more question. There's a big blower back here, so it's hard to hear. It's 6 TV. Having gone to uh, more than a few key expeditions to some pretty rare places, I find myself on doing CW and SSB. So if you're 153,000, what percentage of those are FT8? Is that the future of our expeditions? Computers talking to computers. That's a, that's a really good question, Jim. Uh, so the question, Jim has been on a number of expeditions, and his question is, what percentage of QSOs do we think we would be making over FT8 compared to CW or phone? I like to work CW. I don't work much phone when I'm on an expedition. Uh, CW is, is, for, is the purest form of communications as far as I'm concerned. Um, so if you looked at 100 to 110,000 cues on a typical expedition, you're probably looking at 30, 40,000 cues of FT8 to get you to 150. That's just the math. But no, not operating 100% FT8, sit and drink and pita coladas and watch the computers make cues. That's not the objective. How much time do we have? Okay, and one more question. Yes, sir. I can't, I can't hear you back. How many rigs do you run at the same time? We've run up to six rigs simultaneously. Since the power systems, uh, there's a, a correlation between the generator and the rib. That test was really de uh, meant to determine how many ribs we can support over the 900 megahertz link. And we can support six ribs simultaneously with bandwidth to spare. Step forward, because this water. The yes, the, te the, the temp internal temperature of the rib and the temperature of the amplifier are monitored by the control system. Thank you. Craig, is, is that yours over on the side over there? Uh, thanks a lot. Whoops. Thanks very much for that update on the rib. Okay. We appreciate it. You know, those of you that attended the dinner last night, one thing we left out was a moment of silence for those who had gone before us. And I said, we'll do it two times next year as long as we weren't doing one of them for me. So, all right, our next speaker. Before I do our, introduce our next speaker, is Thomas or Karen Vincent in the house? They must have been here from the forum before. Okay, well, it has a phone number on the back, so we'll call him. <laughs> on this phone, right? <laughs> All right, our next speaker, thanks for uh, the, the two that we've had so far. We want to remind you again that we're selling tickets in the back for the raffle, and people are on the sides that uh, are here to, uh, to sell tickets for the raffle. I want to emphasize this raffle does not benefit our club. This uh, it, what do we do with the, anything that comes from this, which is, since it's donated by ICOM, and we very much appreciate their donation, all of the profits go to funding the expeditions. The Southwest Ohio DX Association is one of the premier fundings for a small club or a club, I think, in the world uh, for DX expeditions that are coming up. Well, you've had a couple of good uh, topics so far, and one of them has given us some education now. Uh, we have somebody from the league, and we very much appreciate uh, Bob coming up here and talking to us about DXCC. After all, what is this all about? DXCC. We're DXers. We're looking at chasing for the DXCC award. And we appreciate Bob coming, 
And if you don't know him, you're going to know him in a few minutes. We, and he's going to talk to us about the league's view and, and anything that's going on there. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And um, good afternoon, everybody, uh, here at Xenia, Ohio. And uh, this has been unbelievable for me. Um, seeing so many friends, you know, it's been at least three years for all of us since we've seen each other. So. Um, I, I have enjoyed the heck out of it, and I hope you all have too. Um, I'm kind of new on the scene uh, as far as being with the ARRL. Um, I've been there just shy of a year, and uh, part of my responsibility as uh, Director of Operations is overseeing the DXCC program, as well as all our other awards programs. So I've got a, quite a bit under my belt, so to speak. Um, and um, it's uh, very challenging. Um, some of you guys have some opinions. Surprise, surprise. Um, and some, some of those opinions are not in favor of the way things have gone in the past. Um, I realize that. Um, I am uh, intending to clear up some of that. And um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, and uh, once my tenure is up, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll get a, a good rating uh, from everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where DXCC came from, where it's been, and where it might be going. Um, you know, the ARRL is all about ham radio. Um, it's, it's not only about our membership which uh, we certainly would welcome any of you who are not members to uh, join up and um, uh, support the activities of the league. You know, we represent um, not only United States hams in ham radio interests, but we, we generally represent uh, all amateurs worldwide in many uh, arenas. And um, so we're, we're all about uh, advancing the art, science, and imagine this, the enjoyment of ham radio. Um, that's the part um, I've always focused my attention on in my just shy of 50 years being a ham. And um, this is my 36th visit to a hamvention. I've never had a randomly changing computer before, but we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do here. Um, but I, I felt really sorry for Steve here before where the thing was taken off with a mind of its own, but I, I'll hope to uh, counteract that. And I've only got 135 slides, so it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> Actually, divide that by 10. I've got uh, 13, including the, uh, the beginning one that you've seen several times now. So um, one of the um, things that, um, you know, has been controversial is what you're seeing now. Um, I'm just going to remove the remote from there just in case. Oh, thank you. Off. Let's hope so. All right. Um, I, uh, I earned that wood-looking thing, uh, and I was ding-dang proud of it. And HK0NA was the operation that put me into qualifying for honor roll uh, not too long ago. Um, and then um, when I got to the league last uh, June, um, one of the young ladies who handles the awards distribution, she says, well, we have a new one, you know. And I said, really? I wasn't even aware of the new fangled awards. Um, and she said, sure, I'll have one made up for you. So there it is. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I kind of like the wood one. I, I wanted one of those for decades, and I know a lot of you all did too. So we brought it back. Um, all of the, the wood plaques that we've all yearned to achieve uh, are either available now as an option or they will be shortly. So um, 
we heard you. And uh, so some people, however, like the new ones. So we're going to have both. So that's a little news. Um, we're going to continue on this theme of being educational. So this is a word that I like. I've never used it before, but I've heard other people use it, and I always thought, like, oh, gosh, are they snooty or what? But prescient is a word that I think describes the guy who thought up all of this. Um, and it's having prescience, knowledge of things or events before they exist or happen, having foresight. It's a wonderful thing. K9CT has that. Uh, and a few others in the room do, um, but uh, it's it's a, a wonderful thing. And the fellow who uh, had prescience is uh, Clinton B. DeSoto, W1CBD, who back in 1935 started all of this with writing an article about how do we count countries. And um, he um, uh, he, his story began with the following sentence. This piece has been started half a dozen times in the past five years. It has been the subject of more cerebration, love that word too, that's thinking, and contemplation and tabulation and plain downright misery than one cares to recall. That is so prescient if you think about what's happened in the world of DXCC since 1935. And uh, there's been a lot of mystery, a misery, and mystery, for that matter. Um, and every subsequent manager of the DXCC program has great respect for his prescience and uh, insight as to what we were going to be dealing with. But this genius who thought this thing up also made some unbelievable statements um, such as this one. The basic rule is simple and direct. Each discrete geographical or political entity is considered to be a country. A few moments consideration will serve to show that this is the only workable rule. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How things varied from what he thought back in 1935. But um, the DXCC program is um, probably uh, what the league is best known for globally, um, and it's very sought after, always has been. Um, we all know um, th those who have gone before us, who many are not here anymore. Um, I remember seeing members of the NJDXA who were the last man standing at the DX dinner out here with tears in their eyes, and uh, we all know why. And. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up about it too, but um, um, in, uh, in 1996 a program was begun called DXCC 2000 and um, the guys who did that really did an incredible job. Um, it was comprehensive, um, they covered nearly every possibility, they didn't think about rigs in a box, because uh, they weren't possible back then. But pretty much everything else was very well covered. Um, and uh, the rules that they wrote back between 1996 and 1998 are essentially what our DXCC rules are today. Um, some of them cause great consternation, but as you know, in the last 25 years, uh, there have been very little change. Um, in fact, very little uh, new countries, uh, I've been a couple, uh, you know, Kosovo and, uh, you know, some others perhaps, uh, but none have been deleted. Um, the rules preclude deletions uh, without very, very good reason. So, um, you know, I, I was thinking, um, you know, we're past uh, Y2K, uh, maybe it's time that there should be a um, DXCC 2100 committee. I don't think any of us are going to make it to DXCC 3000. Um, so perhaps let's let's uh, you know lower our target a little bit. Perhaps uh, 2025, if we can do it in a hurry, 
uh, or maybe 2035 would be nice because that's the 100th anniversary of the DXCC program beginning. So maybe that's a way to go. Um, the other thing that, that occurred to me um, in uh, handling questions from various uh, earners of uh, the DXCC award um, is uh, maybe we need to think in different ways of making um, the, the, uh, the award and DXing more fun more often for people. Um, you know, once you get on the honor roll, there isn't a whole lot to do unless you're going to be really diligent about chasing band countries and so forth. Um, so um, I think it's time that we start thinking about other things to do. Uh, perhaps um, having an annual DXCC competition, um, you know, of course maintaining the lifelong achievement aspect uh, that's very important to all of us. Um, but, um, you know, while, the, while we want to think about it carefully, we really don't want to go crazy and, uh, you know, blow the whole thing up. So retaining the um, lifetime achievement uh, aspect is, uh, is, I think, paramount and uh, something that we can't depart from. So I, I would urge all of you to think about that. Like, what might we do? Um, you know, th there's a lot of uh, concern about the history of amateur radio, uh, history of uh, political changes in the world over time, and maybe we could, we could have like endorsements for special events or something. Uh, you know, the hundredth anniversary of something significant. Um, you know, I, I hope we can begin a, a dialogue about that. And the way to begin that uh, for everyone here um, is through your uh, AWRL uh, representatives, um, including the, whoever is your local representative on the DX Advisory Committee. Um, these guys are all very experienced uh, in DXing. All of them are on the honor roll. One, K4MQG, has honor roll qualification on 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10, separately with five sets of cards for his honor rolls. Okay? That's pretty cool. And uh, that re re really represents a lifetime of effort. So. Um, that's another thing. We don't have an award for that. Maybe we should. So that's something else we want to talk about. Um, the, these, uh, these types of discussions I, I look forward to uh, via, uh, you know, online discussions, uh, email uh, groups. Um, you know, everybody is uh, pretty free to, um, you know, opine, and they do. And um, I, I would really uh, uh, request that, that you give some serious consideration to thinking about something that can improve the DXCC uh, program for all of us. Um, again, I, you know, I'm relatively new on the scene. Uh, however, I have been DXing for 50 years. So, um, um, you know, and I was a at one time, I was the youngest member of the North Jersey DX Association. Uh, that was uh, back when I was 21. And um, it was uh, quite an achievement back in those days. And I'll tell you that some of the guys who sadly are no longer with us were uh, originators of uh, a lot of what goes on, especially here. Um, you know, the uh, North Jersey DX Association along with Southwest Ohio DX Association kind of kicked this whole thing off back in the 50s. And, um, um, you know, having uh, DXCC gatherings and uh, DXer gatherings and bringing guys in from other countries uh, has been a, a, a wonderfully enriching thing for me personally, and I hope for all you as well. Um, and uh, on behalf of uh, the AWRL, thank you for coming. Uh, for Dara, I think they've done a great job here. Thank goodness we've got great weather. And uh, we look forward to uh, DXCC in the second century of the uh, AWRL. So I thank you for your time. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions any of you might have. But again, 
take it easy on me. I'm the new kid on the block. So. Sure, sure. Any questions? Green shirt in the back. Yes. It's slow, it's antiquated, it needs to be fixed. Actually, um, it's better now than it was a year ago. But yeah. QRZ, it's an antique. Oh, absolutely. No argument. No argument. Um, however, um, you may have noticed or heard rumor of a big change that happened on our website uh, about a month ago. Yeah. Well, what we did is we got rid of the old junk that it was running on top of, and now we have a modern infrastructure that all of our old stuff was kind of plopped back on top of. So we can now begin to make changes we couldn't make. So we're, we're just starting on that. We're, you know, it's, it's a long overdue upgrade to our systems. And there's plenty of dirty laundry to air out over who was responsible for not doing stuff for decades, literally. But it's pointless. So, but I can, I can assure you that the guy who's the CEO of the ARRL now is a competent uh, CIO from several major companies, um, and he gets IT big time. So once we get rolling, it's gonna get fixed, and it's gonna be quick. So, yeah, oh, hold on just a second. Oh, well, con congratulations to you, sir. He's the chairman of the DXCC 2000 committee. You guys did a great job, really outstanding. All right, and um, no. yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it is this system that LOTW runs on an old system. It was. A year ago, it was a very old system. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, part of the new regime, um, and uh, there's a, a fellow who's not a ham, who is an IT expert. His name is Jim Shaw, uh, who is uh, working at the league. He is um, updating the components of the uh, logbook of the world system the operating systems, the hardware itself. The hardware that we have it running on is under warranty. So that's, that's certainly not an old clunker. So, um, but it still needs to be improved. Um, you know, the system was developed on a less than a shoestring budget, zero years ago, 20 some years ago. Um, and uh, Steve Ford, uh, who worked at the league, uh, did it on his desktop machine, the first development work for Logbook of the World. Um, and it's remarkable that today there's almost 1.6 billion QSOs in the Logbook of the World database. And I, I mean, I, I know sometimes it goes a little slow, but it's because it was designed to do one log at a time. So when we get a lot of logs, they get queued up and they get pulled in one QSO at a time. Does this qualify for an award? Yes, it does. Put it in there. Next. And, and it does that log by log, line by line, and it's very slow in today's terms. However, we're running it on a much faster box than it ever has been before. So now it clicks along and it does sometimes hundreds of QSOs per second. So that's a big improvement. Um, there have been some problems, confession, uh, where we, we were running at one QSO per minute uh, not too long ago, but 
we, we think we have that all straightened out. But it's going to continually improve. Now we have the new under infrastructure underlying everything, and uh, things will get better. So, okay. Um, green shirt in the back had another question or comment. Okay, and your call sign, sir? NS4P. NS4P? You're our new card checker in Southwest Florida. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. We, we are, um, we, we've become aware of this limitation. Forget it. If you guys need more card checkers, let's get more card checkers. We don't necessarily need more, we need more to show up. Better ones. Okay, I'm NS4P, you're in. All right. Anybody else would like to volunteer? Okay. All right. How we doing? We done? It's inactive. Well, kind of, sort of. Yeah, it's not deleted yet. Yeah. But, okay, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your visit. Thank you. You got it back? Okay. We appreciate uh, the ARL coming. We appreciate the Great Lakes Division Director for helping us make this possible. It's been a long time since we had the ARL participate in our DX Forum, and I thought, gee whiz, this is what it's all about. So it, uh, we really appreciate them them being here and, and working with us on this. Again, a reminder, tickets for the uh, IC705 are in the back. Uh, on people walking around here, 20 bucks for five of them. All the proceeds, since it was a donated item, go directly to funding more D and better de-expeditions. And we're ready for our next one. Uh, Jeff, where are you? Come on up. <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping, and we're hoping this is going to go okay because uh, we had a little computer glitch and issues uh, to start with here. This one will not be a PowerPoint presentation, but we hope uh, you'll you will enjoy it. As I said at one point here, part of what I like to do is ha have some information or some education that you might not otherwise obtain. I was very fortunate that someone suggested to me two years ago, I think it was, that I contact TZ4AM and have him come and present at the uh, Hamvention. Was it you that did? Oh, okay. What? Anyway, uh, we are that fortunate. Jeff has agreed to come. He's here, Tango Zulu 4 Alpha Mike, and he's got a, quite a story to tell you. And it's gonna take us a few minutes to get set up. So I guess what I'm gonna do is a, something a little bit different, is if you've got some other questions that, to ask him before, while we're setting it up, We'll let him have the mic, and you can ask some questions now. Any uh, questions uh, for TZ4 AM? I'll be glad to answer it while uh, while we try and set up uh, this uh, the photographs. No questions. No questions. Okay. In the meantime. Uh, I'll tell you the story of how I got into amateur radio and how I got into amateur radio in Mali, because the two are closely linked. Uh, when I was 13 years old, back in 1957, uh, I had an uncle who worked at Raytheon, and I think he was my inspiration for getting into amateur radio, although he was not an amateur radio operator himself. And I was growing up in the Boston area, and... Uh, so I, I learned Morse code, I found uh, someone to t uh, take uh, the test for me, and I passed, uh, uh, I passed uh, fairly quickly. And um, shortly thereafter, uh, I, I bought a Globemaster uh, Scout and uh, uh, Halicrafter's S85, and operated all through my high school, uh, all through my time in high school, and uh, uh, continuing uh, into college. 
until I came home one weekend from college and found that my father, who was not a, a real fan of amateur radio, uh, uh, had cut down my antennas, put my transmitters in the basement, and given my room to my brother. And uh, so instead of just putting up a dipole and starting again, I left amateur radio and did other things uh, professionally. I went into uh, development economics and in terms of uh, hobbies, I went into bicycling. So, uh, fast forward uh, about, oh, and during the time that I was operating in, uh, as a K1MMB, uh, I operated mostly on 40 meters, entirely CW. I got an ARL award for 30 words per minute, and, uh, but I, after that I could listen to uh, Morse code like it was uh, someone talking uh, up to about 40 words a minute. Uh, and uh, then I left it for about 50 years, although in one aviation in incident, uh, knowing Morse code and being able to identify a, a wrong radio beacon, I think probably saved my life. We're so, ready. we're ready. Okay. okay. So all you have to do is hit the arrows to go forward and backward. That's all right. That's backward and it's projecting up. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so, for 50 years, I went off and did other things. And uh, thanks to K1VR, uh, who uh, some of you may know, who's, uh, who used to put up antennas with me in the highest points of trees uh, and uh, helped me build my uh, reversible 40 meter wire beam for Europe and for VKZL. Uh, he, he continued in radio and uh, law and he's uh, saved a lot of people a lot of problems with their homeowners associations and the local, t uh, local uh, municipal governments. Uh, in any case, uh, my father died and he saw these obituary in the Boston Globe and he got back in touch. And he said, Jeff, there's, you really should get back in amateur radio. No one has been operating from Mali for the past two years and you're set up there now and uh, you would be very popular. And second, your call sign, which someone else had, had held, K1MMB, is now free again, and you could get your old call sign back. Well, those, with those two incentives and two or three years to think about it, uh, I got back in, and uh, so I looked around for my amateur radio licenses and found out that they met the same fate as my transmitters, antennas, and room. So, um, I had to start again. I got my technician uh, uh, at a fair, uh, amateur radio fair that they have every year in, in Miami, and then my general uh, at uh, the uh, Miami Dade Radio Club, and then I uh, started doing the amateur extra class, and I noticed that two things had happened. 50 years had gone by, and a lot of things had changed. And also, some of the things that I knew 50 years ago, I'd forgotten. But with a little help from uh, some people from the Everglades Amateur Radio Club, and one lady who uh, was uh, very, very sharp on taking tests, uh, I managed to get my amateur extra class back. I didn't get my commercial licenses back, but I wasn't, wasn't really interested in those. I was interested in amateur radio. So, with these licenses, I went to the regulator, regulatory authority in Chile. It's called the uh, AMRPT. Uh, it's related to telegraph posts like it is in a lot of countries. And uh, I told them that I, wanted, that I had a U.S. license and I wanted to get an amateur radio license in, in Mali. And they said, well, don't you know we're in the middle of a war and uh, we don't just give out amateur radio licenses to anybody. And uh, so I had already met people who had amateur radio licenses who were working uh, with the UN Peace Force uh, trying to uh, uh, keep the peace. And uh, I said, it's unlikely that an American is going to be uh, supporting the, the efforts of the Jihad. So they gave me a license. Uh, my amateur radio uh, club in Miami uh, loaned me an ICOM 718. Uh, and they gave me a, a crash course of 10 minutes on how to operate it. And so I got on and made four or five QSOs from, Mo uh, from, from Miami, including one to Belgar Bulgaria with an antenna that was not higher than this. And uh, so that got me back interested in DX. 
So, when I got to Mali, I, uh, I bought an ICOM 718 and put up a G5RV antenna and uh, then went on uh, from there to, uh, uh, to start putting up different kinds of antennas. Uh, I lived in an apartment building and had, uh, in theory, at least permission to use the roof to put up antennas. But I think the permission extended to a G5RV and as some of you may know, I uh, tend to like big antennas. Uh, I, I put up a reversible 40 meter beam uh, when I was uh, just out of my novice in, in, uh, in Boston many years ago. So, uh, so the antennas got bigger and higher and this caused a few problems with the landlord. Um, let's see if we can see here uh, something of, uh, of the way things look uh, in Mali. I'm not sure how... Uh, let's see. Where is the where is the light switch here? Okay. This uh, this picture is of uh, Denny uh, Castor, uh, uh, who's a, a French amateur radio operator and is a technician on a, on a factory in Mali, and he was one of the. Uh, people and uh, who helped put together the uh, initial uh, station and continue to provide support for the up until about a year ago when he let when he left Mali and uh, now he's in in France and behind him is uh, Boubacar Koulibaly who uh, works with me keeping antennas working and uh, doing maintenance for uh, my building and uh, he's a TZ5TT he also got his uh, amateur radio license uh, I think we have this in reverse order. I'm going to go through it fast. Okay. I'm not sure if we're in exactly the right place. This is the base when, uh, when I, soon after I set up the, uh, the station, I get interested in 160 meters and I made my first contact with the ICOM 718 and a 40 meter uh, dipole. I disconnected the ground part and I called it an uh, inverted L and I actually made it to Germany. That's what got me interested. But then after that, we uh, put in an inverted L from the roof down here. Uh, this little room here is the uh, toilet for the outside toilet for the workers of the building. and. Uh, we put a Coke bottle as the base for the, uh, for the, uh, for the 160 in inverted L. All right. And this is the, the view skyward directly up. And what we're using to, uh, to, su to support the vertical part of the inverted L is a piece of bam bamboo. The bamboo that you normally get for a fishing pole or something might be two meters long. Uh, this bamboo was 11 meters long and we go straight to the forest to get it. There aren't, aren't a lot of trees in Mali, but there is bamboo, and so we go straight to the forest, get the bamboo, and then uh, carry nine meter poles, nine to 10, 11 meter poles on the, on the roof of old uh, minibuses uh, to get them back to the station. So, uh, shortly after we got the station going, uh, some people get, uh, got me interested in six meters. And since uh, it's not a question of, uh, of uh, you know, sending to a, a JK or, so, or one, of the, uh, one of the companies making antennas, uh, I, I looked up on the internet and found YU7EF Pop, who designed beams, and he had a, uh, he had a five or six element beam for, uh, for six meters. He uh, kindly gave us proper dimensions. And so what we did is we had a piece of PVC and uh, we put the beam up. The boom of the beam is made out of bamboo and the uh, elements are made out of PVC pipes and inside or attached to the uh, PVC pipes is electrical wire. And with that beam, I made my first contacts on six meters into Europe. 
So we use, we have to adapt the radio to the local conditions and the lo local materials that are available. So this is what the building looked like. Uh, we put up a, a hex beam. We uh, were looking at uh, a spider beam or something like that, but uh, we decided the tuning and adjustment might be too, too complicated. So uh, we bought a hex beam from UK and had it shipped down. And all these uh, lines going vertically are uh, mounts of, bam of bamboo poles that are approximately 10 meters long, 10 meters, about 33 feet. And uh, so we had, as you can see, the roof of the building was just packed with antennas. And um, this is the station I have now, but uh, this is a, a better view of the, of the bamboo, so you get a feeling for how, how long these things are and how difficult it would, it, they are to transport to get back. Um, and here's the hex beam that, uh, that we put up. Uh, we built a, a small uh, light tower of about nine meters to put it up. And as a result of uh, putting up all these antennas on the building, uh, the landlord decided that uh, we should pay rent for the roof, which he had generously offered us free before, and he started locking the access to the roof. And that was quite unfortunate because when uh, we put up the six element, uh, excuse me, the 10 element uh, six meter beam, which I had someone bring down by truck, by land from uh, Spain, uh, as soon as we put that one up, uh, the beam overlapped the building on one side and overlapped the building on the other side. And uh, the landlord thought that this was uh, you know, too much and um, began making uh, very, very uh, difficult problems for us and locking the, the door so we couldn't get up there to move it. We didn't have a rotator. And so we had to uh, turn it by the Armstrong method, which meant we had to get up on the roof. And so that caused immense problems. Eventually, one uh, Sunday morning, I decided this was enough. It was never going to get better. And I walked down the street. And before I got to this corner uh, where, uh, where the car is parked, I found uh, someone who came up to me and said, Monsieur, are you looking for an apartment? And I said, yes. So we found a much better location right on the corner. If you look here on the left, you see a wall. That's the wall to the cemetery. Uh, to the north and the east of the QTH, if you look at the QRZ page, there's a, a map of the, of the station. So we're here located right on the corner, which means we can build beverages up to 400 meters here on this side of the cemetery. We paid the local town council after some negotiation $200 approximately per one time and they give us permission to uh, put up beverages uh, on this side, pointing 45 degrees, which is like Turkey or Greece or something like that. So it covers most of Europe. And going this way uh, is uh, 315 degrees, which is approximately uh, North America, Boston, uh, Maine, places like that. So this is a look in the other direction. Uh, if you look to the right side of the picture, there's a uh, there's this, uh, cliff that's uh, about one kilometer from the house. Fortunately, to get to North America, we don't have to go over the cliff, uh, although I think the angle is, is, is adequate so that we're not having problems because it is in the way for going towards, uh, uh, towards um, the... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what, but we, ha we have good propagation in all directions. The building is taller than anything around in spite of the fact they've built just recently a new building uh, right uh, to, the, uh, to the southeast. So this is uh, the HF antenna that we have, which is uh, a... Uh, E antenna uh, Wemo 59 plus log Yegi, and uh, it works basically like a, a two-element beam, approximately. Underneath it, you see the solar panels. We have 32 uh, solar panels, and it was uh, and two controllers, uh, one 5,000 watt uh, inverter, 
and the system was put in. Why? Because there are power cuts constantly. That's one. Two, electric power there costs over 50 cents U.S. per kilowatt hour. Uh, for, in Florida, for example, it costs about 14. So it's very expensive. And the system was put in as a backup, but it works so well that we uh, run basically full time. We can run a maximum of 700 watts uh, using this, uh, this system. So here are the people installing uh, the 10 element six meter beam. We have a crew of, of timer, a climber, uh, tower climbers who come and uh, as you can see, there's no crane, no bucket, or anything like that. Uh, but they are carefully belted in. And this is what the, uh, the beam looked like in the afternoon when we, as they were putting up the first time. And uh, this is an additional shot of them putting up. Here in the, on the left is a room uh, on the, built on the roof that uh, we're currently using for storage of, uh, of uh, various amateur radio equipment. Uh, but we're beginning to recruit young people for, as amateur radio operators, and this then becomes uh, the amateur radio, uh, the shack for the club. There's a club in, uh, in Mali called the uh, Club de Radio Amateur et Affilié du Mali, C-R-A-M. And uh, uh, the president is Hamadoun, Hamadoun Yatara, uh, someone who visits the United States periodically. And uh, he, we've been trying to recruit some young, uh, young people to join, and uh, we're beginning to get them. There's a young woman who's working as an intern for me who said she was interested. And she got her license last week as TZ0YL. And uh, uh, the Malian government doesn't require code tests, no, uh, no testing of any kind, uh, but I do. So for us to pay for a license, uh, I insisted that she learn five words a minute, and she did. And so pretty soon she'll be on the air. So please QRS uh, if you hear her on the air. And this is, uh, this is more of this beam. I think you get an idea of how big it is. This is the view towards Europe. This is a, uh, that's pointing about, uh, about uh, 20, 20 degrees. This is, uh, again, the uh, Bubakar Koulibaly who helps uh, uh, build the antenna. And uh, as you can see, it's got a, a lot of, uh, of uh, 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 support using uh, Mastrant rope. The antenna we usually put up for the six meter DX season and then take it down. So it was down several months ago and we decided to use the, the extra 11 meters of boom to build a three element full sized beam for 30 meters. And uh, uh, K9RX, Gary uh, did a lot of help in modeling and uh, the, the beam is, works very well. I've got as many countries on 30 meters as I have on 40 meters. Our hope is that next year we put in an opti beam uh, 30, 40 uh, beam, uh, reduced size three element beam. And uh, uh, we're also planning on, uh, on changing the, uh, the other antenna. This is, a, this is another view of the, uh, of the solar panels and the six meter uh, beam being mounted. This is the, uh, the HF log, an, uh, log Yegi. And as you can see, we're, we're cramped for space. The two antennas almost mesh. And for that re for, partially for that reason, we built one tower nine meters and the other tower uh, 12 meters so that, uh, that they wouldn't uh, actually mesh. And this is the antenna crew uh, uh, when they were getting ready to, to, to mount this antenna. And this, again, is uh, Denny Casters, who is our, our Elmer there. So um, working in Mali is quite difficult at the present time. I think you probably know there was uh, uh, an invasion from the north uh, in 2012. The jihadis started south, and they were coming towards Bamako. And the Malians, at that point, invited the French government and army to come in. And they stopped the jihadis from coming to Bamako. But here, 10 years later, uh, the war is still continuing. Uh, relations uh, between 
uh, Mali and uh, France and some of the other uh, countries, including the United States, unfortunately, have deteriorated. And so the French have withdrawn their military, uh, 2,500 troops, and the Malians invited in the Russians, including the Wagner Group, whom you may have heard of because they're operating also in Ukraine. And uh, so this is uh, causing a lot of problems with the United States. So we're trying to convince uh, people to, uh, uh, to support Mali, and here in the U.S. Uh, that's rather difficult because the, uh, the, the government that's, that's there came in as a, uh, a military, under a military coup, and uh, we, uh, that forces the State Department to cut off all kinds of foreign assistance. So um, that's basically the status of uh, things in Mali. I'll be going back at the end of June, so I should be on for the six meter DX season, and we'll put together that 10 element beam that we've been looking at, which overlaps again both sides of the building, but we've got a landlord who doesn't care now. So uh, we should be on uh, six meters, and uh, looking forward to hearing you all. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you is uh, everybody knows about Timbuktu, and a few of you, uh, because of DX, know about Mali, perhaps, but uh, a lot of people don't put the two together. Timbuktu is in, right in, uh, in Mali, and it's in the area in the north that's uh, very insecure. So I keep hoping that one of these days the security situation will change, and it'll be possible to do a de-expedition to Timbuktu. And uh, I've already got the QSL card, because as you know, Q Timbuktu is the end of the earth. So I want a QSL card that shows someone happily pounding away on a, on a, on a Morse code key and uh, sitting on top of a camel, and the camel walking off the edge of the earth and looking terrified. Okay. okay. I don't know whether you can see this well enough in, in the background to this, uh, to this picture. This is a logo uh, that I used for my station and for my QSL card. It was designed by Ibrahima Diakite, who's uh, one of the, uh, one, in my opinion, one of the best artists in, in Mali. And uh, what the card says, it shows on the left-hand side, it shows uh, someone mounted on a horse and the, the, this comes from a monument in, in Mali that's not far from, uh, from where I live uh, that shows a soldier from the Malian uh, army before the French came in. This was the, the last time the Malians beat the French. So instead of having a, a colonial era rifle, uh, I've changed it to an AK-47 <laughs> because uh, they're now back in the, same, in the same battle. And on the right-hand side, you have people... Um, you have people playing uh, a kora. Kora is a, a very long-necked uh, musical instrument like a, like a guitar or a ukulele. And uh, Mali is really a, a tremendous influence on, on modern, uh, modern music. So the, uh, uh, some of the Malian artists come here frequently to the United States and uh, up until uh, up until the, uh, the war started uh, t more, than a, more than 10 years ago, people like U2 and Bono used to go to a thing called the Festival in the Desert, and everyone would gather around and play, play music for about a week. And of course, all that stopped. Uh, Mali is so beautiful that uh, tour the tourists were constantly coming down, especially from Europe, and uh, Tourism was their number two export. Uh, I think cotton or livestock was, uh, was before that. And uh, that's, of course, com totally stopped. And that leaves the, uh, the country in very, very bad shape because uh, people depended on that income. It's one of the poorest countries on Earth also. So. And there's one more thing. Just It's not part of Jeff's, but I don't, I'm going to ask him as we get to it, as I show you here. You notice that building... There uh, looks like all concrete. It looks like they just added that on there. And I'm not sure it's the same in Mali as the other West African countries I've been in. But banking, you're saying to me before that the French control it and they don't really uh, uh, lend easily. So the banking in, in that I found out in, in Western Africa is uh, very hard to do. So what people will do is they'll build their building 
with as much money as they have today. And then they'll leave the rebar sticking up, and then when they get some more money, they'll continue building the building. And that's, you know, it's different than the way we do it here. And the first time I was in West Africa, I didn't understand what all that rebar was sticking up out of the, uh, out of the buildings. So, you know, things are a lot different there. Uh, all right, we're ready now, folks, getting there. Your last chance. Your la well, wait a minute, before I do that, any other questions for Jeff while we have him here? Yeah, one more. What kind of battery does he have for the solar system? Uh, these are sealed lead acid batteries. They're called Atlas. Uh, they're 200 ampere hours. Uh, we had another battery in mind when we were going to uh, put in the system. And Molly, as I told you earlier, you don't just, uh, you know, tell the people uh, at Amazon you want it the next day because you don't, that's not happening. So we didn't find the batteries we wanted, so we bought, with much trepidation, we bought these Atlas batteries. That was uh, in February of 2020. And uh, one thing I didn't tell you about those solar panels <coughs> is that instead of having meetings downstairs in our meeting room, we have all meetings upstairs under the panels so that the wind can blow whatever COVID might be around away. So, um, and one more thing in terms of the rebar, the building, there's a building next door uh, to the, uh, towards the south that uh, I'm afraid might go up very high. And that was one of the reasons because we were watching the rebar because uh, just as uh, Jay says, people, there is no mortgage People build what they can with the money they have, and then they continue when they, when they have more money. But I've been told that, uh, that it's fixed at the height below, uh, below the antenna. Other questions? Yeah. Are your exposed rebars resonant on any <laughs> Very important question. Okay, very Im The question was whether the rebars uh, that are exposed could, in effect, uh, affect resonance. Well, the rebars are basically grounded, so I don't, th I don't think so. Uh, but we have terrible noise problems, uh, not, and I can't tell whether it's uh, coming in over the bands, but we, I've made virtually no contacts on 160 or 80 meters, and I'm trying to figure out whether it's just bad conditions everywhere or whether there's something happening there. We have a grant from a generous donor, uh, Zorro, who's no longer with us, of $2,000. So if anyone can help us figure out the noise problems, uh, Zorro gave $2,000 to uh, help uh, with whatever is necessary to, uh, to solve them. There was another, another question back there. Another I, question? Guess not. All right. You're talking about the batteries. Uh, I, my first trip to West Africa was to help put a repeater on for some missionaries. And we're climbing up this mountain, and this guy's carrying this battery that weighs half as much as I did at the time, which was about at that time, probably, let's see, uh, uh, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but hey, about 100 pounds. This guy's got the battery on his head, and he's just walking up the mountain like this. Uh, strong folks. Anyway, hey, it's time. I'm gonna bring the drum up. Where's the drum? All right, drum roll, please. <laughs> Whatever. Ray, come on up. We wanna thank again. Got a few more? All right, last chance. Even though you put it in last, we're going to shovel, we're going to turn it. But <laughs> Come on up. Last chance to buy a ticket. Again, we want to thank ICOM for the donation of this IC705. And again, all the money that we get from this is used to help fund the expeditions. ICOM has been very great in uh, helping us throughout the years make this happen. Ray, we want to thank you very much on behalf of the club. You go ahead. Well, a few years ago, I went to Mozambique for C82DX, and I know what he's talking about, not only the rebar, but also as we're driving along, I'm like, there's a lot of 160, 160 meter antennas and found out it was actually grounding antennas. So there's a lot of lightning out there. So that's why the rebar's grounded. <laughs> right.